The, all of the, our three sessions this afternoon require extensive network applications and, and place demands on the network behind, it, behind them. And they're, they're really presenting the, the benefits and uses of the, the network. Our first speaker is Ted Hans, who's uh, worked in the medical school in the University of Michigan and was before that um, heavily involved and probably still is heavily involved in Internet 2. And if Ted can find the... <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Right, so... Ted. All set? Thank you, Thank you Michael. As Michael said, I'm Ted Hans from the University of Michigan Medical School, and I am talking today about uh, new medical applications, or uh, a survey of what I've learned in the last 18 months after leaving the National Networking Organization, Internet 2, where I was for eight years, I returned back to campus, and it's interesting to see things from the end user perspective again after having spent so, many time, so much time on an international, uh, national international networking. And so I'm sharing this presentation in part to, for an exchange of information, to find others who are working in similar or complementary areas and maybe sparking some information exchange or potentially some future collaborations. So the University of Michigan is a large public research university. The medical school is a pretty good size, certainly nowhere near the, one of the largest in the U.S., but we're attached to a very large hospital, so we have 2,000 faculty members in the school and the, uh, the budget is nearly a billion U.S. dollars per year. And what I was hired to do was come in and be an innovation manager for the medical school. That is, we have had efforts in terms of you know, administrative computing, but no one's looked at how the medical school can be a real innovative leader in using information and communication technologies for teaching, learning, and research. And that was the perspective I came into this role uh, 18 months ago. So a number of reasons why, you know, talk about this in the international context. That is, the University of Michigan really thinks about itself as being a global medical school. We have students who are, will end up practicing around the world. They'll be working with colleagues from around the world. And so it's important to think about medical school not just as an entity within you know, a, city, a single city, uh, but as truly in a global context. And again, with the networks that we've, we've built, we really can virtualize the experience across whether it's education, clinical trials, or basic science research. And I'll give some examples that touch on, on those areas. So, you know, very simple. You start off with things like image sharing. And we learned that the kind of images that you might use will get more and more complex and will drive higher and higher bandwidth requirements of the network. So one of the questions that might get asked is, you know, what is the network requirement for these images? And I, the answer is it just increases continuously each year as you look at both uh, multidimensional and higher resolution data sets. But we do have applications, for example, well, this is a picture I took of a uh, medical school in China where looking at images that we may be interested in well because there are gastric cancers, for example, that occur much high, more highly in Asia than they do in the U.S., but with travel, and other kinds of uh, movement of people around the world, we may be exposed to those patients. So how do we actually educate our students about that? Well, one way is by having a partnership with this medical school in China where we share interesting cases with each other. Now, you can talk about moving the images around, but you also could talk about actually sharing the instruments themselves, both for remote observation, but also for remote control, for operating the instrument. And so you have examples of electron microscopes, light microscopes that are used in a network basis because sometimes it's a rare device. So this, the world's largest high voltage electron microscope in Japan is being operated by a researcher in California without him having to travel to that site. Then you might have light microscopes that may be located in another part of a campus where the, the faculty member in his or her office can be looking at it and operating the stage remotely sort of more economical use of those devices and bringing those into the, the network as just regular, regularly available resources. Now, in this kind of, those last two contexts, we talk about just sort of moving information around. 
But the environment that I'm trying to build is one of a truly rich collaboration environment where you think about all four quadrants of time and place, where you have same time and same place, those of us interacting here in the room and the coffee breaks. Then you have different place at the same time. So you have the people who may be watching the netcast of this, but they're in a different location. And unfortunately, they can't participate in the coffee breaks, and so they miss out on some elements of the meeting. Then you have same place at different time, so that if I actually had written some notes on the wall, come back later and look at the board and see what was recorded here. And then different place, different time, is somewhere someone else goes and looks at the recording of the netcast from this session. Well, the objective I'm working on is how do we make each of those four quadrants as functionally equivalent as each other so that you really can not lose out in terms of collaborating with other individuals regardless of where you are and what time it is. So an example of a, a project that's just started extending into uh, Europe started with that researcher I showed you at the University of California, San Diego, accessing the high voltage electron microscope. He started this program called the Biomedical Informatics Research Network. And these are uh, neuroscientists who are working together to share information among their various projects. Right now, as I say, it started off in the U.S. with 26 sites across the United States, and they just added two sites in the U.K. But they're working on creating these data sets of uh, neurological images and mapping that to, uh, uh, to various ways of mining and exploring that information, regardless of where it is across the network. Some of the interesting things about this is, one, is the, the physical infrastructure, the techno technology infrastructure to make this happen, the servers in each of the sites, the collaboration technology, but uh, probably an equivalent, if not higher, amount of work went initially into sharing the intellectual property rights, coming up with data sharing standards for the site so they can move the information around each other. So when I look at lessons out there, it's not just about you know, what model of a server did you use, but also how did you address these other you know, policy and social aspects of communicating with, with the other groups. And so this is an, you know, a very good example where they've explored all that in terms of both the policy side and the technology side. Now, one of the ways that we often communicate among these groups is using technology like the access grid for video conferencing. But you look at it from a medical context, one of the issues we have with this is that the limited resolution of each of these images because many of the things that we're looking at, whether it's we're looking at a scanned image from an MRI, for example, or uh, something higher resolution, or actually looking, as an example I'll show later, at the hands of a surgeon operating within a, a patient, you know, it's not captured within this quality video conferencing. So we started getting an understanding of how the Access Grid can build multi-site sort of persistent presence for collaboration. But what's really driving our, our uh, interest is what's going on in the high definition video space for video conferencing. So this is a, a project I participated in last year where it was led by the University of Washington. And the technology that, that John Delaney was showing at the last session is what we were using for connecting up to over a, about a dozen sites around the world. And so this, this was at a conference in Seattle last uh, November, and they showed the different sites participating. You know, a little close up you can see the, the multiple sites uh, engaged from Two sites here in the, the, uh, the U.S., this one right here, I'll show this image in just a moment in terms of high-resolution imagery, uh, another prediction, medical school, uh, Ayan Vaharan from SurfNet, and uh, another illustration from, uh, you know, connections from Australia and Japan. So in very high resolution, such that this picture here, Eric Hoffer at the University of Michigan is sitting in front of a large tile display and with HD video conferencing, you have the ability to actually show the images in the background you know, very high resolution for you know, teaching or shared research. Now, the stress this puts on the network, we're talking about 1.2 to 1.4 gigabits per second for each flow. So it puts a lot more stress on the network than the access grid. And so one of the things that I've been working on is bringing in uh, a 10 gigabit per second uh, circuit into my office to be able to start experimenting with these applications to find out is there validity in use and how we can apply them to uh, medical education and research. Now, this connection that I'm getting right now is connecting to the ultralight physics network because that's a group of people who've got similar interests in very large data sets and very large data flows. But if there are any people out there interested in looking at how medical applications can take advantage of optical networking, I'd be interested in talking to you because two of the examples that uh, often referenced 
One is high energy physics, and they're needing bulk data transfer, but that's not a real time application, and the medical applications are typically real time. The other one is radio astronomy. That's a real time application, but is generally very loss tolerant. You know, if a telescope, radio telescope goes offline, you still have enough other inputs in order to correlate to create useful information. We, have, we are not loss tolerant with medical applications. So I'd be interested in actually looking at you know, various medical applications for that I'll show here in a moment, whether they can take advantage of some uh, wavelength-based networking in order to provide the kind of quality service, security, and other attributes we need. So one of the big points for us is actually is, is training. You know, as, as more and more of the surgeries either are you know, bringing in new techniques or becoming much more specialized, the experts out there that we want to tap into may be spread anywhere in the world. And so a number of schools have been working together to provide mentorship opportunities across the network where you may be actually working with a surgical trainer that may be based on somewhere else across the network, and that may be a mentor situation where someone may be virtually looking over your shoulder, looking at your technique and advising you, and again, the inputs may be coming from completely different places than, your, uh, than where you are located. And so one of the things that we've been working with Stanford is medical education of our students where they're learning from uh, experts like Leo Heinrichs here who would be based at Stanford. Also in our own environment, we're starting to put together uh, virtual uh, reality and immersion environments around uh, human anatomy. So this is an image of the, uh, it's being displayed within our cave. And again, the idea is here, if we can network these environments together, we can have multiple students, multiple mentors working together and advising and consulting. So we're moving to the space where you offer an anatomy class, you want to use the best expert in the world for being a lecturer and not necessarily who's willing to move to your city and teach at your university. So we've been testing this in, with Stanford where, as I mentioned, you know, lecturers from Stanford are teaching our students at the University of Michigan using you know, 3D uh, imagery that's projected, uh, either projected or on a, on a screen that they sit in front of, and they can interact with that, uh, that lecturer as if a person was in the same room, pulling data sets across the network, and again, multiple students at multiple sites. Now, the thing that we learn a lot about is sort of, again, you know, is the material useful in this context? Do the stu students learn? But we also learn a lot about the stress in the network. The fact that the member who wanted to do this knew he couldn't run it in his office, but didn't know why. Well, the reason was it requires IP multicast, and he, wouldn't, he didn't know that. Our network, which is actually run by the hospital across the entire, even the research and education buildings, they did not support multicast because the same network that supplies all the health records for the patients and other production services. But it took me several months to make, bridge that gap between the faculty member who needed the multicast application and the production network people to where today we actually do have plug in any port and IP multicast is available. But it's that kind of glue, again, when you're working from a national networking perspective, you don't always see it down to that level of an fa individual faculty member trying to do something that will have an impact on a larger organization. And we've also learned that even when it's you know, plugged in and available, it doesn't mean it's always working correctly. This application requires a lot of context switching as you pass off to one individual or another individual's control of these data sets and communications that, again, flowing across multicast. And that change over some times of tearing down and building up a new multicast group can take tens of seconds. And we have spent an awful lot of time debugging that network. And it seems, you know, again, surprising that we're so many years into having multicast available, and it still doesn't work for application users. And that's one of the biggest you know, cries out there, again, from the end user perspective, is we talk about these technologies, but really they don't work yet. And I'll tell you, multicast does not work yet for, for end users. And you know, that's, it couldn't be any more underscored until you actually try and use it in a production context. Now, some of it's the environments we're trying to build here are for research perspectives. There's a lot of work going on in terms of modeling, sort of modeling, for example, uh, a physiological response. The uh, number of universities have been involved in a project called the Virtual Soldier. And the idea here is actually to provide a tool in a handheld computer that a medic on the field would be able to diagnose a, uh, the, the criticality of an injury of a soldier and make the decision is this someone who has to be treated right away, treated before or after other injuries in the field here. And the modeling here is if, it, if a soldier was shot, 
how much time did you have actually before that you could move to a critical phase of that injury? And these medics only have six weeks of training. So the point is you actually have to provide enough expertise in these models to actually to direct them how to act in the field. Well, to try and model the physiological response to a you know, bullet shot is, you know, takes a tremendous amount of work. And so we had to use significant amount of supercomputing power to actually crunch and develop these models that are then used to, with various physio physiological inputs to direct them to make a particular uh, diagnosis on an individual. Now, certainly we won't be at the point where we have supercomputers in the field, so we have to build a variety of models that are pre-established and then apply them, the, uh, the, what we learn from them, to these uh, handhelds out in the field. But we're using supercomputing in the healthcare field in a way that is, uh, is, is quite advanced right now for the point of actually doing patient diagnosis. Now, the same modeling can be applied to a different context, and that is training individuals before they move into practice. So this whole area is emerging around what we call serious games. And it's one that's a very, you know, we have to be very careful about the word games because people might think that means it's frivolous or it's only for entertainment. But we're in the, med in the medical education field are looking at games that actually build on some of the infrastructure from the entertainment industry, but are now applying it to instructional contexts. And that is in both individual and multi-user contexts, how can you actually go through a simulation, which may be an individual procedure, you know, how would you interact with a patient or how would you actually do a particular kind of you know, suture, for example, to multiple people working together, say, duplicating the experience within an emergency room. So using, again, very robust models, using you know, high-resolution networking to bring people together and visualization to uh, build this hybrid environment that allows you to actually make mistakes and as many mistakes as you can possibly make until you get it right before you actually interact with your first patient. And I believe that we all think that's a good idea in order to, uh, to support the uh, more expertise in these students. So mobile solutions, we talked about very high end, these 1.2, 1.4 gigabit per second flows for HD video conferencing. Here with handheld computers, we're not talking about very high bandwidth, but more sort of ubiquity and also required sort of persistence of access. And we have everything going on in terms of students using, carrying around their lectures right now on iPods. The University of Michigan uh, Dental School and Medical Schools have been you know, delivering the lectures uh, onto, uh, through iTunes so the students can download them right to their, uh, their iPods and then re-listen to, re to a lecture again while they're on their you know, walk to school or on their, uh, on their jog. So it's changing how we deliver education out there to these students. But also we use it for things like tracking patient encounters. As a medical student, you have to see a certain number of patients, you know, say pregnancies or heart attacks or strokes, and how you keep records of that. You know, keeping that all electronically means it always stays as bits and flows to the system, but it means there has to be ubiquitous connectivity wherever they may be, not just in our hospital, but in clinics and other remote sites. And you start thinking about an architecture that ties that all together. Then things, obvious things like delivering patient records, whether that's within the hospital or in the field with the medic. And then things like monitoring patients. One of the interesting things I've been looking at is how we're using things like wireless stents to track a patient who had a stent installed to, in a clogged artery. That we can actually, there's wireless de devices being developed in the research labs now, such that that stent can monitor the flow across it using a, a, a nanoscale device so that you can just have a re remote wireless monitor that getting the capture information off that stent that's actually embedded within the person's chest so they know if the flow starts getting constrained it's time for the patient to come into the doctor not just because it's been a week or two weeks or a month later but because there's actually something that has to be responsive well that kind of networking is again very interesting where you know how do you provide that kind of connectivity where the, pa where the patient may be do you constrain them to his or her home do you allow them to have kind of this connectivity at work and what are the standards for doing this because Again, this is not very loss tolerant applications. So we talk about this environment of all these pieces together, whether it's you know the servers, instruments, libraries of information, people, and so forth. You know, how do we bring it together? Well, there's some interesting work around some advanced tile displays. So this is a, a, actually a part of one that was the University of California San Diego showed off last su September at 55 displays, all put together so you can actually look at. You know, a video conference of an image person talking to you from a remote site, a high resolution image of the data that you're looking at that you can look at at one level and then you can zoom in at other level in the windows and compare that. But also you can have 
uh, images that come from uh, microscopy, oops, microscopy, and from models that you've built. And it really is changing the, the experience. Instead of looking at it as one screen and flipping to another image and flipping to another image and flipping to another image, having this all available at very, very high resolution when you're talking about these you know, high resolution displays and multiply it by 55 times. Again, significant amount of demand on the network because it's being remotely rendered and you may be tapping into resources coming across far from the future. So the thing I'm looking at here is that we're looking at medical environment that spans across medical education, across basic science and clinical care and need to provide a common infrastructure across all of this so that the information that's developed in the basic science area does very quickly make itself to clinical care. So trying to build a common infrastructure across all of them. So at one point, talking about one network run by the hospital across our medical re education and research facilities sounds like a liability because of issues around firewalls and whether multicast is turned on. There's a benefit in terms of maybe it may lead to quicker information flow across these various components of the uh, spectrum. So again, going back to why I'm trying to, you know, bring this to you know, to all of you is that when I was at Internet 2, I was the director of applications and looked across the entire spectrum of disciplines out there. Again, the kind of things that you heard John Delaney talk about, high energy physics, astronomy, and you name it. I thought the medical field was a place where the most some of the most innovative uh, uses will come in the future, and where uh, in many cases the resources are there to do the build infrastructure, and I think that my experience over the last 18 months has really reinforced that to as being true, and I really think this is an exciting area, but it's an area that actually in many ways is still way behind the uh, many other fields and really takes some, needs some push to move forward, and one way to make that push is by those of us working together uh, to help the physicians, help the researchers see what's, uh, what's possible. So we're really looking for opportunities where we can you know, think about global medical education, global uh, healthcare environments, sharing experiences as, uh, in particular, we have a much more global and mo mobile global uh, community. And giving you an example of what's going on within APAN, the Asia Pacific Advanced Network has been doing a, a number of things in, in the medical space. There's a medical working group there that has been focused on using DVTS, or you know, DV quality video conferencing, to show surgical training and education events. And at each meeting that they have, they set the bar for a new kind of capability, bringing in a new country, bringing in a more uh, higher quality experience, bringing in new people, and that's sort of a forcing function to get more and more cooperation among the, both the networks, the national networks that are supporting this, as well as the end users within the hospitals and the schools who are participating. So one way to think about working in, in the future is by tying into these kind of collaborations or having duplicate experiences off on, on other national and continental networking activities. So as I said, throwing this out here because, say, looking at an environment that is from an end user perspective, you know, is not necessarily delivering the bandwidth that we need today. Things like multicast aren't working. That there's a clash between, you know, perspectives of firewalls for, from the clinical care, from the, the research side. And these are, and if you're building a collaboration, you have to consider both the policy side, like I said, intellectual property rights and and data sharing standards, as well as the technical infrastructure for delivering that collaboration. So brought, throw this out here as an opportunity for us to actually find other people with similar interests or supporting similar groups out there, maybe it's just information exchange, pointing out opportunities, but maybe actually working together on some future experiments. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to come back wearing a different hat now and saying how you know we as end users really love all that you do with the national networks. Uh, but there's lots of opportunity, particularly in the, uh, I say, in the healthcare space, to do some exciting applications that can really again show the future, like John Delaney showed with his uh, Neptune application. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much. Right. We have time for a couple of questions. If... Please. Thank you. I was asking if you can think of any specific reason that will make you move away from multicast. Whether we would want to move away from multicast? Uh, yeah, so some of the solutions here are to try and fix multicast, make sure that everybody has, you know, whether it's, you know, moving to, uh, you, know, away, away, you know, away from the current models of multicast into the newer things in IGMP v3 and so forth. The other one is to move to application layer multicast 
and not have to worry about dealing, you know, trying to debug the network and how the application works. And that's uh, the, one of the hard things for you know the people who are the application users is that they, you know, they can't make that decision. There needs to be more of a dialogue between the people who are building the application, and the people who provide the, provide the network infrastructure. So there, there may be some solutions out there, but there's not there's a there's a disconnect between the application developers and the network engineers, and that's what needs to be uh, closed. Okay. Yes, again. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, many of the applications you showed required video, and especially high-quality video. Do you also foresee or do you have examples of uh, medical applications that require other uh, large data sets or other types of collaborating between the systems and, right. and, and persons? Certainly, the, all, all that physiological modeling, for example, that's all data-based. I mean, that's, you know, the, that, that, all the imaging that I've talked about in terms of you know, they may use video as a way of, of transporting it, but I mean, it's, it's all bits as it starts off in terms of scan images. But take the physiological models. You've got very large physiological models, and you want to add some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, you know, pharmacological models to it as well. So you're talking about data sets where you're actually, you're starting to build, I mean, if you use the sort of term web services interfaces among these various device, uh, models, so that the physiological information is informed by the pharmacological information, which leads to some kind of treatment decisions in terms of what are the sort of approved approaches to a particular injury. And these are just, these are just sort of big data, first modeling and, and then data mining challenges. And the, the kind of data sets we're talking about, when you start talking about things down to the protein level, for example, are, you know, huge, you know, you know gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte size, size of data sets. And they don't all have to be moved in real time, but you want to be able to have them, you know, you know interacting with each other appropriately. And that gets back to some of the metadata standards for, for doing that. Okay, thanks very much, Ted. I'd like to um, call a halt there. Ted, in fact, is chairing a session later on in the week and will be around, so if, if there are any other questions, uh, uh, Ted will be around. So thanks very much, Ted. Um, our next speaker, who's also talking on a medical uh, theme, is Martin Beck from UNIC in the Netherlands, who's been with... <laughs> All right, from UNIC well. in Denmark, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, I, I, I don't know how to recover from that, Martin. Uh, but, but one of the things that, that uh, Martin has been with UNIC in Denmark for the last 20 years or so, and um, he's also well known in the Torina circles. If people have been at Torina conferences for the last few years, you'll see that the, the person that chronicles the conference photographically, and he's even proving it now, is Martin. And, and I, I commend anyone after the talk to go and look at Martin's uh, photographs of both this and previous conferences. Yeah. Let's have a smile. Sorry. Well, thank, oh, thank you. Well, first I'd like to, like to thank the program committee for being able to come on on, on short notice, but this is really a, a, a topic that develops uh, uh, fast. Well, as an NREN, we are in the business of providing network network infrastructure, but we're also providing usually other stuff, like, uh, for instance, supercomputing facilities, some of us are involved in that, or providing special things for physicists or uh, uh, the bioinformatics people, uh, for radio astronomers and so on. We do that heavily. Then, a few years ago, we were uh, at UNIC, uh, led to think about what are we really pro ah, healthcare, is that important to us? Health research, is that important to us? Yes, it is, but what are we providing? To those guys, nothing really. Look at this. If <clears throat> basic internet connectivity, of course, we provide that to hospital, especially if it's a university hospital, no problem. We provide basic internet connectivity. But what about all the other nice stuff? Video conferencing. Are they using video conferencing in hospitals? Yes, indeed. Of course they are. We just saw several examples. But are we providing it? No, we aren't. Because it can. the usual... Uh, video conferencing facility used by or provided by the NRENs cannot be used because of privacy uh, uh, constraints and so on. And also collaboration tools, we provide that, yes, but not to uh, uh, hospitals, to the health sector, and so on. Um, IPv6 we don't provide to anyone. But <clears throat> apart from that, roaming services, security, grid and the like, we provide that 
but not to uh, the health care uh, sector. So uh, simply, plain old internet is not just enough for them because of security constraints. And this is not only, I mean, securing the, the, the uh, data while it flows on the, uh, the open network is, is no problem, uh, really. The biggest concern, uh, if you want to provide internet connectivity or provide, really serve the healthcare sector's need of IP traffic, then the biggest concern is actually that they need to open their firewalls uh, to use the common network. And that creates a lot of holes in the firewall that no one really, um, uh, that is very difficult to keep track of. And that's why uh, they, they are really reluctant to do that. They will much rather do point to point or closed networks or whatever. So you can see everyone in that sector too wants to exchange data, but they have um, <clears throat> firewalls, control mechanisms, so on, that prevents them from doing that. and they just can't open at the rate and uh, at the number of connections that really uh, is, is the need of the users in the health uh, care sector. So we came up with a solution, the so-called connection agreement system. That is a little invention I'd like to, to, to tell about really here. Um, first, if we look at the situation as it is, uh, the, classically, you know, without the connection agreement system, usually we have a user at a hospital at the right, no, the left for you, and he wants to um, access a service, say a repository of x-ray uh, uh, images or whatever at another hospital. Now, in order to do that, he has to identify, first of all, his local firewall administrator. That's the happy face up there in blue. And for a large hospital, that can be quite a challenge. Who of the maybe three, four firewalls at my hospital, which firewall is actually blocking my way to those data, and who is administrating it, that's, at least in my country, that seems to be a bit of a problem if you have a large hospital. Go down, ask your, if you ever get into a hospital, I, don't, I hope you do for work, not for other purposes, but if you do, try to ask some doctor who is the administrator of the firewall that you are using. He doesn't know. Okay, so next, next thing. He has to contact, usually he knows who's in charge of the service, the repository, say, of x-ray images, but he doesn't know who is actually managing his firewall. And then they have to make some kind of, of, of uh, agreement, either VPN or have a special connection or whatever, uh, in order to actually supply the user over there with a connection to the service he wants. Now, uh, and it even gets worse. Once this service, for instance, expires, it is shut down or whatever, uh, who is remembering to remove the rules in the, uh, in the firewall rule set? I mean, it's, it's not um, impossible to document, but it's not a, a common in the trade of firewall administrators to document who ordered every rule and when is it going to expire and why do we have a, this particular rule in the firewall. It's, it's, it's just not there in practice. <laughs> For a manual example like this, it's no problem, but imagine if you have a, 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 a health sector of, say, just like here, 50 uh, entities, and you want to make VPN connections between all of them or uh, administer other kinds of connections, dedicated lines or whatever, MPLS networks, you get an amount of rules that are unmanageable. And that's why we uh, came up with an, an idea called the connection agreement system where you, instead of, uh, I can, instead of the words, I can show it uh, in this picture, the local user, the user A down there, he doesn't know, need to know anything about who is his firewall administrator or the network topology or anything. He just goes to the orange box up there called the connection agreement system. There he finds in a repository all the services that are offered on this network. He finds it and he says, I want to connect to this one. Okay, so then a message goes out to both the firewall administrators and to the, the owner of the service. Do you want to, to um, uh, accept this connection? And they all in this, uh, they get a mail of course and then they log into the connection agreement system and say yes, both uh, parts of this, they accept this agreement and then the rules in the firewalls are automatically updated if the firewall administrators allow it 
Otherwise, they can review it first and then have, have it updated uh, uh, later on, okay? Yeah, that's what it says there. I can show it to you. That, uh, these are screenshots from, from our uh, connection agreement system. It says here I have two agreements awaiting approval, which in this, yeah, we'll, we'll learn to spell it. Um, here we have it. Uh, the parts in white are just the audit trail of, of this particular, uh, uh, don't matter that, it's the part in gray that is interesting, it says who is or asking me to, to have this agreement and so on, and I'll just approve it, and then the firewall rules are updated, and you can see the results afterwards. These are just of the several thousand agreements made in this way uh, from our central connection agreement system. Well, in Denmark, this started in 2001 where uh, some guys called, uh, from, from an agency called Medcom, which is a standardization uh, body uh, for all of Danish healthcare. It's not a ministry of anything. It's, it's a kind of association of, of all parties involved in Danish healthcare. They came to us and said, we want some kind of interconnect. You are running the Danish Internet Exchange. Why, why, why can't you do something like this? And we said, well, this is completely different, but we'll do it anyhow. Um, and uh, there was a tender, and, and uh, we, we had a long process where, where all the polit political issues of, of this uh, thing, of course, was dealt with. And um, then we went into reg regular operation uh, uh, a year ago. And um, let's have a look at the situation. You see the blur thing up there is Denmark, um, and, and the blue lines are... Uh, an approximation of the fibers that make out the Danish research network. Okay, so these are the fibers. And back in the old days, before we had this Danish um, uh, healthcare network, um, if, for instance, the university, uh, uh, the hospital at the University of Odense in the middle of the picture wanted to exchange X-ray images with uh, the University of Aarhus, for instance, they had to make some kind, the red one, some kind of special, actually they had a fiber connection. Uh, uh, they could have anything, but not on the regular network because it's people's chests and uh, whatever they are transmitting. It's not allowed by Danish law. So <clears throat> they had to do something special and the traffic was not running in our blue fibers. Too bad. Now, so we made this connection agreement system and, and, and set up a whole uh, a bunch of, these are all the parties of, of the Danish uh, um, medical, the Danish uh, health, health sector. And today we have all hospitals on. We have all pharmacists. We have one third of all uh, uh, general practitioners, uh, doctors. We have one, uh, the half of all the special doctors and we have uh, laboratories and uh, uh, all the uh, local authorities and so on. So virtually it's everyone in Denmark who's now connected on this network and uh, well, we have some mm, technical stuff. I'll skip that. But the thing is now, with the connection agreement system, it all runs on the research network in a VPN from, again, the traffic from the University of Odense to a central hub in, in Lyngby and then that's up there, our, our main uh, um, operational center, and then to Aarhus. So we've gotten the same traffic to flow on our research network, and everybody's happy. Now, this network, what, what is it uh, used for? First of all, uh, a lot of, of uh, hospital equipment actually has a web uh, interface, but uh, if you want to sit at a GP and see, see for instance, the, scanner, uh, the scanned images of of um, uh, your patients that reside, but the scanned images are residing in hospital, you have to have some kind of web access. So it is really much used for that. It is used for uh, also uh, various kinds of telemedicine. Uh, even though Denmark is a small country, we have a, a lot of small islands, and uh, to go into a doctor of those islands, uh, instead of having to take the ferry, you just go to your local doctor and then he calls on the video phone wh whoever uh, he needs to consult along with the patient. Um, again, video conferences, of course, they use that. We also have a collaboration platform if, for instance, a two, two of, um, uh, doctors or so want to uh, share information about a patient, um, 
where they don't share the common, a common administrative system. They can upload the data into this collaboration platform and, and, and thereby look at it. it. It is also very much used if people are, are traveling across the border to, to get um, uh, treated. Otherwise, we can't exchange the, uh, data, especially with German. That have, they have a very rigid law on that. And also we have a national health portal so that everyone that is, uh, who is in a, a patient record system in Denmark, they can, be, they can access their own data through this national health portal. And again, the connection from this health portal to the real data is on this Danish healthcare network. Now, the direct benefits for <clears throat> the health sector is, uh, is uh, clear. Um, apart from what I've said, actually, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, e-prescriptions and uh, other stuff like uh, reimbursements, uh, referrals, um, discharge letters and so on, they are actually small messages on the network that are exchanged and they were exchanged um, uh, for like uh, 30 cents uh, before we got this network and then when we got the network it, the, the price of, of uh, those messages uh, dropped uh, by a factor of 10. So, um, that is that that alone paid for the whole network. But you can you can't do that in other countries because you don't have that much message uh, that that big a message passing volume. So this is a special case for for Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, <coughs> Finland, where, where where you have that. Okay, but apart from that, um, it is. We can see that the rise of online, use of online applications, online uh, uh, collaboration is, is really uh, uh, rising uh, tr tremendously and also we've got a more efficient market for service providers like for instance in the old days uh, if Aqua or Philips or Siemens they had to, to, to make a service contract for some kind of, of uh, x-ray scanner or MR scanner or whatever, they had to have a special line installed in order to, to log into the thing. Now they can just get a, a, a one uh, connection into the healthcare network and they can make a, a connection agreement with whoever they want to sign a contract with. And that has given a more, much more efficient competition. So there's a lot of business case stuff in this. Now, um, <clears throat> this idea of a connection agreement, it, it has shown to work on, on different network architectures. We have all the traffic past a central hub in, in, in Denmark, but in Sweden, uh, as you can see in, uh, in this one, where, uh, well, you have to interpret it, the this black stuff is network traffic, network connections, whereas the red lines uh, sort of symbolize that uh, the proliferation or the distribution of rules, okay, into the little boxes that are firewalls. So, <laughs> I'll give you a moment to study it, but the idea is that <clears throat> we have the Danish hub. This is actually, all this is something that exists today, okay? So we have the Danish network. We have a Swedish, there's a Swedish network that is also connected to the Danish one. The Nor uh, in Norway, they, they have connected uh, various hospitals. And also we have uh, uh, VPN connections to some hospitals in uh, uh, Estonia and Lithuania. Um, and in, in Sweden, for instance, they have a, 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 an open MPLS network, and then they have the security uh, in the firewalls at the edges of that network, and there the connection agreement system is used to document all the rules that are in all, all of those firewalls. So, um, Sweden is on. Norway is starting a pilot project about how to make uh, this system uh, nationwide. And we also have shown that, that with uh, uh, in some EU and uh, E10 project called Baltic eHealth, we have had these uh, Estonian and Lithuanian hospitals. And we've also had uh, expressed interest from many countries, but um, <clears throat> so, so far we are very happy about uh, this and, and haven't had time. But anyhow, I, I, I think this is important because it is a thing that will come upon you no matter what you do. Now, look here. If we have the healthcare network, then suddenly, okay, the healthcare network itself does not provide basic internet connectivity. We did that as an NREN or any telco can do that really. It, it has nothing to do with this. But once we are in the network, we can again put a box on that network and provide video conferencing services, which we do. 
collaboration tools. I showed to you a screenshot there. Uh, uh, roaming services, grid security, whatever, is actually on that network. So we are now back in business. Uh, um, also for the healthcare sector. So have we solved, solved all problems? Well, we've shown that, that you can create healthcare networks uh, in quite an inexpensive way. I'll come to the uh, figures in a moment. And um, also we have show, found a cheap and easy way to uh, actually manage the increased complexity of, if everybody wants to make private connections to, to everybody, really. Um, and, um, but it doesn't solve all, all problems, of course, because this is a system that uh, uh, provides network connectivity, but it does not uh, ensure, for instance, uh, working the, the, uh, that applications can talk to each other and so on. Um, we don't do that. In Holland, for instance, they have a project that is focused on the application side, but not on the network side, so, so that's another approach, um, naturally. So what will it take to do this at home? Uh, the only thing you have, have to do is to team up with your local and friendly health authorities, because if you do that, you can get the software for free. Um, it is uh, written uh, using open source tools, and, and, and you can have it for free, but it is uh, these MedCom guys that, that have paid us to do it. Uh, they have as a prerequisite that it is the health authorities they give it away to, and they have to sign a memorandum of understanding that any further developments will be uh, given back to the community and so on and so on. And all you do is a few servers and routers to have it uh, from a technical side, and then, of course, these uh, uh, 100,000 euros is, is what has been uh, uh, proposed uh, uh, in, in Norway and Sweden to, to actually have it in place, because you have to uh, assess the network structure, you have to actually uh, talk to a lot of firewall administrators and so on, so there's quite a lot of, of work in, in implementing this, but, I mean, uh, it has been done in middle-sized countries like this uh, for 100,000 euros. So again, and of course you have to have a, a team supporting this. So I think this is really an opportunity for the entrants of Europe. Now, we have the skill and the attitude to do something new. This, I've just explained, is too, far, too, too complicated really for a standard uh, telco. If, if I've tried to explain this to several telcos and, and they, they, you know, Two foils and they are lost. Now, I think you can understand this. You could build it. And uh, that's why I think the NREN in most countries would be the ideal partner for the hospitals uh, to have a network like this. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> this is only, for an, from an NREN perspective, I think this is not only a thing you, where you, 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 you do something special for the, yeah, for a start, it's something special for the healthcare sector. But in, in a future to come, I can see that there is a rising need for like private connections through the network. Private connections, not like lambdas, uh, of course there's a need for lambdas, but I mean, uh, governed by the end users, it would be nice to make just a VPN from end to end. I call them here ultra lightweight lambdas, and it has nothing to do with you know light waves or anything. It, it's, it's just a point-to-point -point connection through the regular IP-based net, packet-based network, uh, simply. But the idea that any user can do this tomorrow is quite fantastic. They find uses of it that you couldn't think of, and you keep the, their traffic in your network. <clears throat> and another thing is that. I think the main growth in traffic will not happen on the open internet. The main growth in traffic, also the applications that Ted Hans shows us, for instance, they will have to be in some high closed networks because of security issues. So get that traffic on, onto the network, and if you don't do it, someone else will, because this is a need to have all these entities we've created on the network guarded by their own little tiny firewall. All of these entities will sooner or later need to connect with close connections to each, with private connections to each other, and you'll have to have some kind of broker in there. And if you, if you don't do it some, somewhere else, uh, uh, someone will establish this service. And they can do it even with, without asking you. I mean, we've uh, established a connection to 
um, for instance, the hospitals of Lithuania, even without uh, uh, consulting uh, the, the network there. We've just done it. Everyone can do this. They may do, be doing it right now without you knowing. Okay. <clears throat> so I propose a little bit of homework until the next time we see each other. You have to decide whether you want to provide such a facility for user managed closed circuits in your network, or you would rather let someone else do it. Okay? And um, you also have to decide whether you need this growth in traffic and this, of course, growth in funding that such a facility will cause because you can really charge uh, uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, we charge, for instance, uh, uh, what is 10 cents per inhabitant in Denmark uh, simply uh, for just having this uh, network on. And the r local authorities, they've accepted it because uh, it, it really solves the problem for them. I think you can go home and do a similar thing. Think about that. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Martin. There's obviously a challenge out there for the NRENs. Are there any questions? We... Otherwise, we'll be here. <laughs> okay, um, as I said, Martin, it's a challenge for the rest of them to catch, to, to catch up. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. And um, our, we have to do a bit of changing with the technology here. Um, but our next speaker is Marco Berni, um, who actually changes the, the topic a little bit from very medical and, and, and scientific aspects to, be, to, to the arts and um, to the arts, art side of the, the, uh, our, our business. And it demonstrates that the, the requirements of the sciences are equally balanced by the, the, the requirements of the, the, the arts. Uh, and archaeology and history, and I'll go across and find some. Right. Um, okay. Marco works. Sorry, Marco works in the um, in the uh, history of science museum of Florence, and um, yeah, <laughs> I work on the um, website and uh, databases. And uh, we um, at the the museum we prepared and um, opened it on uh, this March. Uh, oh, thank you. A, an exhibition on uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, uh, this is a, the, the real exhibition is on the, the Uffizi, is a part of the, the Uffizi Gallery at the mo in this month uh, until uh, January, and uh, um, but we prepared also a, a virtual exhibition which is on the web. And uh, uh, so I can try to, to make some uh, uh, conference with uh, uh, the real and the virtual exhibition. So, uh, okay, this, we can skip this. Um, the, uh, the exhibition is on the, the, the genius of Leonardo, on the whole uh, Leonardo, not... Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, because th there are uh, many, many exhibitions on Leonardo, but uh, all, almost, uh, are focused on some specific area of his activity. Art, anatomy, technologies, water, flight, uh, and so on. Um, this uh, exhibition, The Mind of Leonardo, offers its visitors a different point of view and invites them to explore the genius the, the mode of thinking, uh, the, his concept, conception of knowledge, and, uh, um, and the laws that govern all of the operations of man and nature. So uh, this approach 
uh, gives rise to a different image, uh, one that helps to dissolve the aura of mystery in which the, the myth of Leonardo has often been shrouded. A mind that tenaciously endeavoring the, to decipher the rational processes that animate the phenomena of the, of the physical world, as well as the motion of thought, driven by the desire to achieve a perfect imitation of nature in drawing and painting. Hmm? Uh, so this is a, a, a fly on the, the mountain. Uh, in here uh, there are uh, uh, drawings because uh, it's uh, inside the Uffizi, so there are original drawings. There are uh, models, there are animations, there are uh, virtual models, and so on, and manuscripts. So, um, for instance, this is a, a, a model rebuilt one-to-one uh, -one scale of the Sforza monument, which was uh, uh, studied uh, but uh, never realized from uh, Leonardo for many reasons. And so, uh, when you walk in the, in the exhibition, you can understand the, uh, how giant it was. And okay, so, um, this is obviously just a, a part of the model. Um, but uh, beside it, you, you can see the, the, the drawings uh, from Leonardo for uh, this model, the studies, and, um, or uh, you can see the um, models here in, in the bottom. You, you can see the, the original, the, the drawings, uh, the repro a reproduction of the Leonardo drawings with the uh, um, Dascalias, and uh, uh, there is a, a video, an animation in Matisse Barnett, and. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the photo, <laughs> and uh, uh, there is a, from the, the original drawings on the um, right, you can see a, a, a model, a layer, multi-layer model, because uh, this is a, the anatomy of the female body, and uh, it's drawing like a, a multi-layer, and so uh, in the model, uh, each apparatus is shown on uh, a different layer. So, um, this is um, a, a section on, uh, um, on the library of Leonardo. So, he, he had many books. Here, there are uh, some of them he, he owned and uh, he designed um, instruments to, to draw and used instruments to draw. And here there are some reproduced in the, in the exhibition. Uh, this is a view of the section on painting, showing explanatory models and multimedia illustrating physical concepts discussed in Leonardo's manuscripts. Um, you see on the, on the end uh, on two, two videos, uh, there is a, a model uh, showing uh, some uh, light effects uh, on uh, shadows and colored light. Uh, this is a, a model based on Leonardo studies on perspective for application on frescoes on ceiling. Uh, if you stand from a particular point, uh, you can see the, 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 draw, the, the drawing in the, in the foreground, like if, the, if it uh, was placed in the, in the position of the drawing in the background. Uh, this is a a perspective uh, effect, and uh, Leonardo studied it because if you uh, have to make a fresco on the ceiling, and if you have a vault, you need to, to make some correction to the perspective in the drawing. And so this is the 
many other models in the exhibition. So, uh, and now we, we are at the uh, virtual exhibition. Uh, we prepared it with the, 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 the materials of the, used in the, in the real uh, exhibition. And uh, um, on the website are available all the exhibits, captions, models, and 3D simulations you can find in the real exhibition. Uh, so uh, before we, we can make some uh, uh, points on this, uh, uh, on the real and virtual, let's see some um, points of the uh, exhibition. Uh, there is a, a section on uh, scientific analysis of the adoration of the Maggi. It's a, a study from, of uh, Leonardo. And uh, um, on this drawing there are um, some diagnostic uh, investigations and uh, there are uh, photos on visible light, infrared and ultraviolet. And uh, from each one you, you can, uh, or, uh, scholars uh, um, developed some ideas about uh, how it, he worked, the, what he drove, uh, delayed, and so on. Um, here he, you can see the, uh, an enlargement of uh, a, a part, and here there are some uh, uh, points, some holes in the paper that were used to to reproduce the drawing. Uh, so this is a, a sample from the, the Leonardo's writing desk. And uh, uh, because in the, in the exhibition we tried to, to reproduce this, because he, he was a man that worked, he was a genius, but he, he worked uh, normally. He, he, read at the night uh, with the old lamps <laughs> and, and so uh, there, and this is a, a, there are some uh, samples uh, you can see the, the, the draw uh, quite old from Leonardo but uh, not the second and uh, you can see on the left a lamp from uh, the original manuscript and uh, the, the reconstruction, the model uh, that you can find in the exhibition, and uh, you can find the photos of the model in the, in, on the web. Um, then uh, you can see some compasses for, for drawing, and uh, ellipses, uh, parabolas, epicycloids. And these are models that uh, uh, are used to, to, to make, uh, obviously, technical, but uh, um, technical drawings and, uh, and paintings. Uh, okay, here um, there is a, a manuscript where uh, it's uh, illustrated the, the ellipsis construction, and uh, we, we can try to... Uh, to show the uh, animation which is on the web. It's uh, on, the, on a um, TV on, uh, the, in the exhibition, but it's also on the web and we, we can try to look at it. Okay. Just to, to give you an idea of what uh, It's a loop.
Okay, on the web uh, we, we put uh, oops, a, a low quality version, but uh, however, um, Let's see if it work this time. But okay. However, uh, you can see the, the the construction of the ellipses uh, starting from a circle, and, and this is the method used in the drawing. Okay, uh, we can stop it because. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there are um, about uh, 50 animations and uh, um, of this kind in, on the web, and um, um, so. Um, Another point, the, the geometric man, the Vitruvian man, it's a, a, a mystery, it's, but uh, this is a mystery revealed uh, because uh, Leonardo studies the proportion of the human body and uh, its commensurability with the perfect uh, geometric forms, the circle and the square. Uh, this was a scientific analysis that had uh, both cosmological meanings the correspondence between micro and macrocosmos, and artistic ones, uh, correctly representing the human figure and designing ar architecture based on the proportion of the human body. So, um, what's behind this uh, drawing? Uh, you, you see t two men, one uh, uh, in the circle and one in the square, uh, the navel is the center of the circle. Uh, the, the man in the circle is arm raised and legs apart. The man in the square is arms open and legs together. And okay, the the side uh, of the square and the radius of the circle represent the golden section. This is a the golden section is a point very used in the Renaissance, and it's a proportion very used, very very famous. Uh, and uh, okay, this is the, the. There are many 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 other uh, proportions, so all the the human body is. Uh, uh, studied uh, as uh, proportions. So the, the trunk is one fourth of the height, uh, the arm is one fourth of the height, too, uh, head is uh, one eighth of the height, and, and so on. <laughs> Face is one tenth, hand is one tenth, foot is one seventh, and uh, and there are more, I don't uh, bring here, to, <laughs> to don't bother you too much. But, uh, um, okay, um, so that's that, uh, a mystery revealed because he, he, he wrote uh, these uh, proportions. Uh, let's see um, a, another uh, uh, problem, another um, strong point. This is the, the, the Sforza monument, the, the equestrian monument to Francesco Sforza, on which Leonardo worked during his uh, stay in Milan, uh, was one of the most audacious artistic and technological challenges of the Renaissance. And Leonardo's approach depended on the study of the perfect proportions of the, for the horse, and on the definition of the muscular conformation of its pose. So he studied the, uh, the proportions. Uh, he studied uh, the, the technical problems uh, for the, the molding of the, 
uh, statue. He uh, could not realize it because uh, uh, Francesco Sforza was uh, uh, jailed from uh, uh, the enemy <laughs> army. And, uh, um, but he, he, he lived as uh, many, many studies. And uh, he, uh, here you, you can see uh, some uh, uh, drawings. Uh, and uh, uh, machines for, uh, he, for extracting the, the mold sections, machine for transporting and turning the, the, the casting mold, uh, a hoist. And uh, uh, here, um, he, he studied the, the, the smelting system to, um, to, to put the, the, the bronze in the, in the casting. And uh, uh, here, uh, here there is a, a reconstruction from our multimedia laboratory and we uh, animated it so I can try to, to show you uh, this is a, a, uh, an animation, okay. Uh, do you think it's in the background? Uh, this one, yes. You can see the, the furnaces here, the liquid metal. Because this um, um, was a very, very large uh, uh, project, and so it needed more than one furnace, uh, so there was a synchronization problems. There was many, many problems he analyzed. And, okay. Uh, Okay, so um, let's uh, see, um, give a look at what, uh, um, which typologies of material we, we offered in the uh, virtual exhibition. We, we offered the images like manuscripts, paintings, chemists, and rebuilt models, real and virtual. And uh, uh, there is a scientific analysis, there are animations, films, and tests. Uh, but uh, why a, a virtual exhibition? Uh, we, we, two main things. Enrich the, the physical exhibition to promote the real visit, to help prepare for the real visit, to document the exhibition after its closing. And the, the other, extend services to a wider audience. To, to offer a, real, a virtual visit, to offer a permanent exhibition, to offer links to other applications, and to supply material for educational purposes. So, uh, because on the, 
on the web on the, of the Museum of the History of Science, we have uh, many other web applications um, which are in large part realized in the, uh, the same situation. When the museum prepared a, an exhibition, a, a, a real exhibition, uh, prepared a, a, a virtual exhibition too. Uh, so we, we have a, the, the Multimedia Museum catalog, which uh, contains all the uh, objects on permanent exhibition uh, that are more than uh, a thousand, and uh, uh, which have related uh, resources like uh, biographical data and uh, in-depth information uh, to give a contextual background to, for the selected objects, uh, to, to explain uh, scientific objects which are um, very difficult to, to, to understand for uh, normal users. We, we have a... A, a virtual exhibition on Leonardo and the engineers of the Renaissance, which was a former exhibition uh, produced from the, the museum, uh, had, which had m many uh, mountings uh, in uh, Paris, Florence, uh, New York, London, and now is uh, in China. And uh, uh, the, these are machines uh, from uh, Leonardo, from Brunelleschi, and the Sinis engineers. Um, there, are, uh, there is a, an application on scientific itineraries in Tuscany. Uh, this is not related to a real exhibition, but it's just a, a virtual exhibition to, to promote uh, places of historical scientific interest in, uh, in Tuscany. And there are other uh, applications from, from exhibition, like uh, well, the one from on Pompeii, on uh, Torricelli and the Horror Vacui, on the Perspective, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, all these uh, applications, or uh, um, the, the, the large part of them, are on the... Uh, in a, in a relational database, are stored in a relational database. Um, we are moving all on the, the relational on the database because uh, we, we find uh, it's uh, useful to, to manage information. So uh, we, we realized a, an application uh, which is starting from a word processor uh, put uh, data, text, and uh, information related to, to images and so on, um, on, the, on a relational database. And uh, uh, from it, we, we can manage it with a, an interface like Access. And uh, we can generate uh, a static and dynamic versions. For the web, we, we generate an XML uh, format and uh, uh, transform it in, uh, in, in HTML with an XSL uh, transformation. And we, but we use it, uh, for instance, for the, the multimedia catalog, the, the same application to generate an RTF file uh, which uh, was used to, to produce the DVD of the, uh, of the collection of the museum. Um, this uh, gives us uh, more flexibility uh, because we, we have separated uh, the graphics from data and uh, are able to, uh, to manage this uh, uh, separately. And uh, um, so uh, the, the next step, uh, which we will start in the next days, is uh, um, to integrate the, the whole. Because uh, at the moment, uh, 
uh, in our database uh, there are, for instance, three applications on Leonardo totally disconnected uh, because there is a, the, the mind of Leonardo, which we have seen uh, just uh, now, uh, mechanical marvels, the um, engineers of the Renaissance, and the, the car of Leonardo, which is another application. And uh, so uh, all of them are in the database. So we, we uh, have to, to keep existing application to maintain a reference on the web to real exhibition. Uh, and uh, we will add a virtual exhibition that gathers and integrates existing data having at the same time a centralized system for data and applications. And we have the chance to share services with different applications, uh, for instance, the digital library and, and LOPAC, uh, carrying out a complete integration of all the archives of the museum. This is the, the opportunity for the creation of a network for the history of science to interchange information among community members. So, uh, we have to, to go out from uh, our walls and uh, to uh, share our data with uh, the, the community of the history of science. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we can uh, use this uh, uh, database uh, to, to collect uh, metadata from uh, uh, other applications, uh, not, all, not necessarily contained in it, uh, like the, the OPAC, the digital library, etc., uh, to give the, the web users a, a unified interface. And uh, uh, to make this, uh, we, we have to, to create, uh, uh, but uh, we cannot do it uh, alone. Uh, we have to create an actual infrastructure for sharing information among the history of science community, allowing integrated access among distributed resources, and producing a, a, a semantic search system for resources. And this can be achieved by uh, the creation of a shared resource of web services, metadata, and uh, uh, search system. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Hey.